probably after his after uh, Jack had died, uh, talking about gun control and being heckled by a guy for the John Birch Society. Have you ever seen that piece of footage? No. It's in New York, actually. Really? He was heckled by a guy about the gun control, and he got the man, oh, fantastic, actually, he got him up on the platform with him. He said, oh, you see, that's a very interesting point you got there. He said, come up, and, and he made the guy start to give his speech. And the man, needless to say, ruined his own whole case, the more he thought. And, 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 and Bobby Kennedy was using the analogy of motor cars, you know, having a motor car license. Uh, because the man was like, oh, there's this oh, fucking fundamental fucking freedom in this country, <laughs> man, and a fucking hell, and a fucking... And uh, that said, you know, how do you feel about your car license? Oh, that's all right, I don't have a fucking mind about that. And he absolutely, what, he was brilliant, he just manoeuvred this man to say, well, make all the points you've been wanting to make. <laughs> so I just, I think it's an interesting area, I think it's an emotive area, and it seemed to me that would be an interesting uh, framework within which to get a debate going, rather like, you know, like, like, like the Scopes trial mm -hmm. on, uh, on gun control. I see that's your, your question. W are we rolling? Mm -hmm. where, where are you based uh, as, a, as a production company? Uh, London. London. <coughs> um, Local Hero is, has, a, has a comedy feel that's very rare in today's films. Um, what was it about Bill Forsyth that attracted you to him to direct the film? Well, I think everything, any, any serious <coughs> decision you ever make in your life is always an amalgam of things and never, never any one thing. Um, <coughs> in the case of Bill, I was at the uh, Edinburgh Festival, Film Festival, in 1979, I think it was, uh, and I saw this sort of student film he'd done called That Sinking Feeling, I liked a lot. And any sane producer must, uh, in the last decade, have been looking for a kind of Frank Capra, Preston Sturgis type of director, or someone who that type of humour would come naturally to. And I felt that that was what Bill was. So uh, we met and we discussed a few things, and he offered me Gregory's Girl, and being a really shrewd you know, picker of material, I turned it down. Uh, and as I say, to his eternal credit, he took no notice at all, in my opinion, and went off and raised the money elsewhere for it. But what had happened is I'd, I'd said to him, well, uh, I didn't want to make Gregory's Girl for two reasons. I didn't think it represented for him a big enough jump from what he had been doing, from the student picture he had done. And in 1971, I made a film called That'll Be The Day. Which, which was, as far as I was concerned, my rites of passage film. And uh, it seemed to me to be deja vu, as far as I was concerned, to go back. So um, I, I persuaded myself, anyway, not to do Gregory's Girl. But I found a cutting in a newspaper that I, um, uh, amused me and seemed to me to be the basis of something interesting that I sent to Bill. And it was about a, a lawyer, kind of lawyer accountant figure in the, in the Hebrides, who had negotiated a deal on behalf of the local islanders with a major petrochemical in a multinational company, which was not only the toughest and best deal that anyone ever negotiated in Britain, but also contained penalty clauses about clearing up mess from oil spillage and things like that. And he'd actually invoked the penalty clauses. I mean, it's quite remarkable, and, and, and made them clear up the mess they made and fined them, which he was allowed to do in the fine. Anyway, the British government obviously was so impressed that they brought, got hold of the guy and brought him to London, and he, and he ended up running the British National Oil Corporation. And I thought this was, a, this was an interesting area, and I wasn't sure that was a story, that was an interesting area. So we hired a local journalist from that part of the world, and uh, got him to come up with similar stories of things that had gone on when the, you know, when the giant petrochemical companies clash with the locals. And from all that material, Bill developed a treatment and then a screenplay that became Local Hero. Sorry, it's a long answer to a very short question. But, uh, Is there any you know, kind of precedent other than what you just mentioned in terms of, uh, of an American oil company moving into a uh, Scottish village and, and kind of taking it over like Oh, that. it happens all the time. I mean, it's, it's, been a, it's been a constant in the last 10 years. And the film's been there to make for anybody. The question was whether one did it as a thriller, mm -hmm. or whether one did it as a comedy, or whether one did it as a, you know, rem or, or as a love story, you know, American oil man meets local village girl. The, the, the film's been there to be made by somebody. It was a question of what, ter what tone of voice you wanted to tell that story in. You know what I mean? Your background uh, was in advertising originally. Yeah. Huh? Um, what kind of uh, traits from, from that business have you brought into your motion picture career? Um, I would think too, I mean, at a, a risk of sounding presumptuous, I think I was trained, my father was a photographer, I was trained to have a strong visual sense. At one point, I think, in my career, too strong. But I think uh, there, was, there would be a very valid criticism of my films that I produced, where that style outweigh content m a few times. Uh, but certainly a strong visual sense. And the most important thing advertising teaches you, and it's important to do it and important to get out of it, is um, uh, that there's very little point in making something that people that there is, for which there isn't a market, but that it is possible to create a market. So uh, I think that the kind of fundamental disciplines which 
affect or infect my work are those of, 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 of an, an ex-advertising man. After Chariots of Fire, were you looking particularly to, to produce a comedy? Yeah, I think so. I've been looking for, to produce a comedy for a long time. Actually, it's, 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 uh, it's something I wanted to do. And, um, but I wanted to make a particular type of comedy. Again, there's no short answer to this, I could, but I can give you, a, I think, a, a possibly an interesting answer. I felt that since Blazing Saddles, the entire drift of American comedy had been towards what I would term the, the, the farting comedy. You know, I mean, the, the Richard Pryor, basically vulgar humour. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean, I think they're very funny films. But they ha have they've opted to go for that form of humour. Lowbrow. And lowbrow. And that form of humour has become comedy. I mean, th that form of humour was, was usurped the uh, the title comedy, and that has offended me a bit because, you know, the one of my favourite forms of film. It was, was what was invented by America, which was a romantic comedy. As I say, the Sturgis films, the Capra films. It's an American art form, and it seemed to me that you'd abandoned it. Uh, we copied it to an extent. With our, our Ealing films were only uh, localized versions of, of, the, of the Capra pictures, in, in my view. Uh, so I found it ironic, and uh, I wanted to badly to move in that direction. That's where Bill came in, that, I, that uh, here, I, here I was stumbling across a, a filmmaker who I thought could deliver that. He certainly has that quality. I yeah. think so. So very, that comes naturally to it. Yeah. In, when you went to, to shoot the film up in, in the locations up in Scotland, what, how did the villagers react to, to the crew moving in? Well, like always, I mean, uh, life followed up a bit. We had a lot of, uh, a lot of help. I mean, let's do with the positive side. I mean, an enormous amount of help. But we came across three or four people who saw it as an amazing opportunity to make some money. And there were two instances where uh, we were getting ripped off. One of which still has never been resolved. I think we're really going to have a court case in our hands where a man tried to hold us, you know, hold us to ransom over a piece of land over which we had to travel in order to get to one of our locations. I mean, it was a real nasty, ugly thing. And it, it was an interesting because it exposed, the film exposed the very best of human nature, which generally dominates that part of Scotland, frankly, and also, needless to say, some of the worst. How closely do, do you work with, in general, with your directors and specifically with, with Bill Forsyth on, on Local Hero? I think Bill would be is, is, is typical of, of the way in which I work. I mean, there, there was nothing extraordinary about our relationship one way or the other. I work intensely closely in the script and pre-production stage, and I feel that if I've done that well and got it right, I can take very much a backseat during the production of the film. I mean, the degree, degree to which a, a producer really interferes in production is uh, symbolic of how inept, inept some fear, but possibly inept, he has been in pre-production. I mean, you should be able to solve those problems. Producer's job when the film's been made is to deal with crises, not to deal with problems, because they shouldn't, you know, problems uh, should have been worked out beforehand. So you become a kind of a troubleshooter and crisis solver, and I think your job is to try and create an environment for the director in which crises don't exist, or problems don't exist. So all he's got to worry about is what the camera sees. It's the only problem. You've, you've given an opportunity to direct to any number of, of, of young uh, directors or directors w with their first or, or second or third features. Um, do you specifically you know, go after directors with, with that kind of background? Um, I suppose so. I mean, it's an interesting question because I've never really been able to come up with an answer. I think there are a lot of answers. One is I got a reputation for it, and once you get a reputation for it, you're, you know, your own kind of macho instinct says, well, I seem to be doing it pretty well. And so there's a bit of that, without doubt. The other thing is I work as a team, as I said, certainly in terms of developing material. I like to develop my own material. I don't want to make someone else's picture. Uh, and I also work very closely with them in post-production. I didn't mention that very closely. And I do, I do need to work with people who will allow me that amount of space. Now, at a certain point in their career, a director, probably rightly, feels he doesn't need to allow the producer that much space because there, are always, there will always be producers around who are just perfectly prepared to raise the money and walk away. I'm not prepared to do that. I don't know whether it's my ego or what, it, but I'm just not prepared to do that. I'm not prepared to be a banker. I want to be a film producer as I define the role of a film producer. So I need to work with people who are prepared to uh, acknowledge that role. It seems a bit, almost a bit of a throwback to the, the Hollywood studio days when you had a creative producer as opposed to many films today that seem to be produced by uh, any conglomerate of lawyers, accountants, etc. Well, I think that's true. You see, I, what I'm trying to find, and I still don't think I've found it perfectly yet, not for even for me, let alone for anyone else, is a middle ground. I mean, there's a wonderful line of, of Gore Vidal's in an interview he did for American Film a few years ago, where he, where he said, looking back, you know, the, the director was really the schmuck. He had a rotten job, he had to be there every day, and he was normally the producer's brother-in-law. 
Now, I don't think that is necessarily a very good idea, nor do I think the idea of films being produced by battery lawyers is a good idea. And I think all I've been trying to do is seek out a, a middle way that works for me. There is as many producers, really, as there are styles of any other form of management. I've tried to produce in a way that suits my personality, gives me a level of satisfaction that, uh, that, that makes it all worthwhile, because, as you know, there's a lot of pain involved. And I wouldn't do it if it was only pain, uh, and if it was only check signing and, all, and the legal bit. I just wouldn't bother to do the job. I'd, I'd do something else. And how do you maintain a balance between the creativity and the mandatory business sense that you must have to succeed? I wish I could answer. I mean, it's, it's, you use your instincts and you hope that your instincts are uh, justifiable. I'm sure that I'm on shifting ground. I think that probably I'm okay at the moment. and I think I'm, I'm, I've got the balance is, is, a, is a good one. I equally suspect that as I get older, uh, the balance will shift wrongly and I'll get less good at it. And I think there is a time when, for my own self-preservation, I should probably shift to being an executive producer and back off and let other people do it. Because I think there is a very real danger, as I develop a reputation, uh, of, of dominating a director. I don't want to do that. But it bec there is an inevitable cycle. I mean, as you know, you, know you, you end up being dominated, you then reach a parity, and you almost can't stop it. It's not deliberate. It doesn't make me a Machiavellian or, or tyrannical figure. It happens. It's to do with balance, it's to do with age as well, of course. And so I think I've got to be careful. And I hope that I can see the signals and, and back off to be an executive producer at some point in the next three, four, five years. You've gained a reputation as being the man who has single-handedly saved the British film industry <laughs> um, because your films obviously are international successes, both critically and, and by audiences. When, when you started in the business, uh, in the film business, coming out of advertising, what was the state of, of the British film in industry? Well, funnily enough, when I... I'm going to back off a second. I tried to get into the film industry very hard when I left school at 16. I tried very hard. I couldn't get in. It was nepotistic. It was geographically badly located from my point of view. Uh, I lived in a part of London that was a long way from the studio. And it was at th that point almost entirely permanent employment. You know, you either worked for the studios or you weren't in it. So I failed. And I, went, I drifted into advertising, really. Um, when I'd done quite well in advertising, and by an extraordinary irony or piece of fate, found myself head of a, a creative group that contained Alan Parker and Ridley Scott and some other people, and we all really wanted to get, get the movie business, I, um, I was able to make that, uh, that switch. Can we start a second? Yes. Certainly. Can you ask them to close the door? I can't. Sorry about that. No, no, it's it's just I was uh, found my no, pension going. I didn't hear it in here, too. I didn't you didn't hear it? Well, no, it's, 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 it's distracting. <laughs> when you entered the... F when you when you entered the film industry, mm. what was the state of the British film industry at the time? Well, when I, I didn't enter it when I wanted to. I, I really basically tried to get into it when I left school at 16 and failed to. Because it, it was as a nepotistic and uh, uh, geographically badly located. I just couldn't physically get there. So I drifted into advertising and having done well, I mean, I was lucky. I, I, I joined an agency that was immensely successful and young and found myself with a creative group that consisted of Alan Parker as a writer and Ridley Scott and various other quite gifted people who also wanted to get into film. Um, I took another swing at it. I took the money I'd, I took the money I'd earned and had another crack at it. Uh, and it, well, I, probably more by luck than by judgment, in truth, it worked. Um, now, the state of the industry by the time I entered it, which was now we're talking about 68, 67, was, uh, it was in a state of shock. It had been overlorded in the early 60s and all the attention from the, from the swing in London, Life magazine, you know, nonsense. Uh, w the British have made a lot of appalling films, really appalling films that should never have been made. There was a lot of mo American money and American producers that have gone to Europe thinking that was where it was at, man, and found that it wasn't at all. And, um, you know, they were all very sensibly withdrawing. Now, that t turned out to be a tremendous piece of luck because literally if I'd gone to come to the film industry two years earlier, I probably could have made half a dozen development deals and got things off the ground, whereas I came in at a time where there was no money. I mean, it couldn't have, couldn't have been worse. But we would, so we, Sandy Leavis and I, when we went to business together, had to work lean. There was no alternative. And I think what we did was we rebuilt not so much a British film industry, because I don't think there is one today, and I certainly have had nothing to do with the rebirth one way or the other. But we built something that worked for us, which was small indigenous pictures. Uh, we had problems, as you know, with performance, which was the very first film we ever did as a company. It didn't work. I mean, it was, it was, it was vilified to a degree. And we managed to recover from that. 
and we re we built something. I wouldn't say we rebuilt anything. We built something from scratch because uh, we were building in a vacuum, actually. Oh, sorry, it's not really a precise answer to your question, but uh, it's the best I can do. I think your, your earlier films um, really, you know, use rock and roll uh, very well, and, and of course performance with, with Jagger and, yeah. and that'll be the day. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, is that you know a reflection on your background and your interests in, in music? I love music. I, I, I have no background in music. I mean, I can't write a note or, or play it or anything. Uh, I love music, and I certainly feel, and I've always felt, I felt this before I came into the film industry. But music was badly served in films. I thought it was uh, antiquated. I mean that the you know that the uh, the Morris Yar type of theme lasted much longer than it had any right to when one considered you know what what was happening to the commercial music sector at that that time. So certainly I came into it wanting to use music differently, and I tried to with that, that'll be the day and with Dada to try and redefine what a music was, for example, with fun. Um, and I still pay an inordinate amount of attention to. The themes. I mean, the, 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 believe me, you know, Vangelis music and chariots of fire didn't happen by accident. Nor did Giorgio's music in, in Midnight Express. And I think the theme music of Local Hero, I'm thrilled with. I think it's delicate, and I think that Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits has done a terrific job. Actually, I think it's it's a pity because because it's it's being undervalued. It's a better score than people are realizing because I think it's so delicate. Um, it's something I take very seriously. I think in a way there are three key elements that make a successful film, and they are the the, the, the words the visuals and the music. And I think they are you know, three fundamentals. And uh, at, at different times in different films, one of those three elements dominates. And sometimes the music can dominate. So uh, I put a lot of time into it. I'm already, I start a film on May the 9th, and I'm already talking to Mike Oldfield about the score. Um, Mark Knopfler started working on, on Local Hero six months before we started shooting the film. So it's something I put a lot of time into, not always successfully, but I certainly try. Well, you know, too, the score for Local Hero is so, you know, so well integrated into the, to the text of the film that, that it, I think if you listen to it separately, uh, which I think, you know, it might get a bit, a bit more, a bit more notice. That exactly, that's exactly what will happen. Well, the album will come out, people will realize it's a damn good album, and then realize that it's, it's all there. What's your next, your next project? I'm starting a film in, in, in Thailand, actually, which is a, a story I bought from the New York Times. It was an entire issue of the New York Times called The Death and the Life of Dith Pran. That's what it was called in the Times. And it's the experiences of a New York Times journalist, Sidney Schamberg, in Cambodia, and his relationship with his interpreter. Uh, and it's about two men. It's classic movie theme, really. It's two individuals uh, against a panorama of, uh, of, of history going on behind them and trying to deal both with history and with each other. I love it. I think it's, a, it's got the opportunity to be a major piece of work if we, if we don't screw it up. Have you hired a director yet? Yes, there's a man called Roland Joffe. Here we go again. But he's, I think, wonderful, and I'm, I'm quite, quite sure. I mean, of all the elements of the film I'm pleased with, it's the script and the director are certainly right. If we put a cast together that's as good, and if I can do my job properly, which is raising sufficiency of, of finance, then we'll be in great shape. In, in your negotiations with um, distributors, uh, obviously now you won the, won the Oscar for Chariots, the great success of Midnight Express. Um, I think your your relationship, you know, now has given you the the, the, the clout to to get the kind of distri distribution deal that you that you want. And has that worked out over the last the last uh, three three four films? Yes, it's got better. I had a very interesting experience uh, on chariots because I had two distribution deals: one for the world outside the US and Canada with Fox, and one for the US and Canada with Warner's. And the Warner's deal was what is termed in the business a gross deal, and the Fox deal was what's termed a net deal. So I had a vivid. Uh, uh, education in the difference between those two types of deals. And I won't leave you guessing as to which type of deal I'm going to opt for in the future. Uh, because one is fraught with frustration and aggravation, and the other one at least, at least, at least is clean. Um, how, do, how does that compare, uh, for example, with some of your earlier distribution deals? Uh, with well, I'm afraid some of them were pretty muddy. I mean, for example, uh, Bugsy Malone was, had five different financiers and the distribution rights were carved up all over the place. It's a question of emphasis. I mean, basically, I've always, my job is raising enough money to make a film in as uncompromised way as possible. It doesn't always mean that the film's uncompromised, because sometimes I'm capable of compromising it, but that's, the dr that's what you start off trying to do. Uh, I like having more than one financier, frankly. Uh, it helps me a lot in terms of you know, the film not being dominated by one source of finance. So I quite deliberately try and split it up a bit. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is protect the integrity of the picture. I'm going through it now with the, this new film because 
It's an expensive picture, it's costing $15 million. And I'm trying to put together the package in such a way that no one person is able to either dominate it or affect it. The whole area is very complex. I don't know if your, if your viewers have got the patience to, to listen to it, but it, it addresses itself to the whole area of completion finance, for example. You know, the, the, the creating a situation where the completion guarantor cannot influence the outcome of a film. More too many films end up being finished in a scramble mm. because the, uh, the fundamental discipline is just to finish it, you know, irrespective of whether good, bad or indifferent. Let's just finish the film. There's no more worthless item in the world than a half-finished picture. So that, and that's the great fear of any financier. Excuse me, we're going to change the table. Okay. Interesting. I'm 